Okay, well, the next speaker is myself, so hi. Um, I'm Stefan Kreber, I work at uh, Canonical on containers. I'm the LXD and LXD project leader, and today I'm going to be going through a year of upstream development um, on LXD, and it's been a busy year. So, um, just briefly, in case someone doesn't know um, what LXD is, LXD is a container manager, but it's a system container manager. So we don't really run the, your usual Docker type workload. We do run an entire operating system. So think of it more like a virtual machine. Um, it's designed to be very simple, both on the CLI and our API. It's got, we try to also make like terminology and everything reasonably clear. Um, it's very fast. There's no VM or anything involved. Um, it is very safe because we use just about everything, every security feature you can think in a kernel, plus the ones we've implemented in a kernel. Um, so that means all of our containers use the user namespace by default, um, they use SecCom, they use Apama, they use, they drop um, capabilities. Um, pretty much anything you can think of, we've got it. Uh, and it's very scalable. It works on a single laptop just fine. You can run multiple systems and then interact with them over the network. Or if you want to go even further, you can start and cluster them and then run like tens of thousands of containers against that. Um, what LexD isn't? Well, I kind of went through that already, but uh, it's not a virtualization technology. We only use um, containers and namespaces in the kernel. Um, so it runs on every architecture, it's very fast, uh, runs inside VMs, like it's containers, I mean, you know what that is. Uh, it is also not a fork of LXE, we are the same project, just LXE has been around for over a decade, it's written in C, it's a low-level C library to interact with the kernel with a set of tools. Um, LXT is one level, one level up, it uses um, LXE through a Go binding and drives it that way. It's, it lets us, like, that way we could provide some of the more modern um, interactions and use Go to make things simpler for, us, for ourselves, while still keeping libLXE in C as the low-level interaction with the Linux kernel. Because for anyone who's been doing it in Go, interacting with namespaces from Go is not very fun. Um, C works way better for that. Um, and as I said, we don't really run application containers. If you want to run application containers, that's perfectly fine. You can run Docker inside a LXD container. Um, we do nesting just fine. That works. Now, as for the actual part of my talk where we look through a year of, um, of containers, well, of LXD. Um, so we kind of the highlights for this year. Um, it was a second LTS release. For us, an LTS release means we tag something. So we did 2.0 um, two years back. We did 3.0 this year. And then we will support it with bug fix and security only for five years. Um, so LXD 3.0 has been released in April. Uh, it's a second LTS release. We've done three bug fix releases on top of it so far. Uh, we do backport most of our bug fixes onto that release. And we do have a five years commitment to bug fixes and security updates on that. Um, we've also done 10 feature releases. We are effectively on a monthly release cadence for LXD. So we did miss two, as you can tell. Um, that was because, um, well, it took us a while to do this 3.0. I mean, the LTS took us a little while. So we were hoping to be able to do the LTS on the side, and, but that didn't work out. So we, had, we ended up not releasing in, uh, uh, I think it was February and March that we skipped. Um, and we've done, as I mentioned, three LTS bug fix releases. Now, there's another thing that's kind of exciting that happened this year. It was a bit of a surprise to some extent. Um, Chromebooks. Well, all Chromebooks ship with LexD now. So our user base grew quite a bit thanks to that. Um, that happened late September. Um, it is advertised as cross tiny or Linux apps on Chromebooks. Uh, when you use that feature, um, it kind of looks like that. The first time you use it, it installs Linux, which is always kind of funny considering you're already on a Linux machine, but anyway. Um, and once you've done that, then you effectively can install apps. You get a terminal, you can play with the terminal, you can install packages inside it. But if you know how to get to it, you can also drop into 
um, Lexd. And you can see that there's one container running, uh, which is called Penguin. That's the default Debian container that runs on the Chromebooks. Um, it's got a special set of libraries and hooks and pass-through set up so that it can reach your graphical server and can render very easily. Um, there are some things that are still being worked on. Um, current working progress on their side is a USB pass-through, GPU pass-through, and sound. Um, those things will be coming. They are all supported by LexD. They're just not available right now on Chromebooks because um, out of an abundance of safety, the way those containers work on Chromebooks is actually by first running a virtual machine and then instead of virtual machine running LexD with all, all your containers. So every user has got a virtual machine and then you can have as many containers as you want inside there. Um, which makes things a bit trickier because while we can share a GPU very easily on the system directly, um, they first now need to share the GPU with the VM, which is pretty tricky, and then we can get it from inside the container. But it's coming. Um, so here I can see I've been spawning a bunch of containers. Um, what did I do? Like I did, yeah, a bunch of different distros to just show that. You can use our normal images, you can run whatever containers you want on your Chromebook. Um, it's all persistent, it all works well. Uh, it uses BRFS as its storage, so if you copy stuff, it uses sub-volumes and it's reasonably quick. Um, and as I mentioned, you even have GUI access. So in this case, what I did is I just, in the, the terminal that comes when you enable Linux apps in your Chromebook, I installed Frozen Bubble. And then you can just go into the app launcher on your Chromebook. Like, you don't need to do it from the CLI or anything. You go into the app launcher, and alongside um, Chrome sheets, slides, whatever you've got in there, you're going to see Frozen Bubble because it actually pulls the list of applications and packages that are installed in your container, and they show up in your launcher. You click on it, and it's spawned, and it's spawned inside your container and shows up on your graphical server. So it's pretty neat integration. I'm really looking forward to, to seeing them land um, more complex integration. As, as I mentioned, GPU, USB, and sound um, are going to be pretty neat because people want to run Steam inside there. Um, and so far it does, so long as the game is 2D and your CPU is beefy enough to run GL in software. Um, but it's going to be much better once we get GPU passed through uh, on those Chromebooks. All right, so LexD itself. Um, 3.0, 3.0 was pretty busy. Um, so kind of the highlights there, um, clustering. Uh, we presented that last year at FOSDEM. It wasn't merged yet. We merged it a few weeks afterwards. So you can take a bunch of LexD servers. Um, when you do the initial configuration through LexD init, it asks you whether you want to set up a cluster. You say yes, and then it pretty much works as usual. And all other systems, all they have got to do is say, I would like to join the cluster, enter the IP address, and now you've got a bigger and bigger and bigger LXD. Um, CLI, API, everything works the same way. Uh, when you spawn new containers, they get balanced unless you tell us where you want them. So that that's was a big piece of work, but it's been working pretty well. We've been doing a bunch of bug fixes on it, obviously, but we've got people running tens of thousands of containers and clusters, and it works just fine. Um, other new feature was also something I presented at first time last year, LXD P2C, which is physical to container uh, import tool. So it's a tool you run inside um, an existing system, and that sucks it up and sends it to LexD to run inside a container. So that tool was released as part of 3.0. We also did NVIDIA runtime integration. So that's passing through uh, your CUDA libraries, your NVIDIA driver, and a bunch of that stuff for containers that want to do deep learning and AI type workloads. Um, we added support for hot plug of Unix character and block devices. So effectively with that, you can say, hey, I want this serial port to go into that container. And even if it's not there when you start the container, when you plug it in, it's just going to detect the U event from UDEV and then pass it to the container. Um, I did some more logic for storage volumes, uh, effectively letting you copy storage volumes across the network as well. Um, and we added a new device as a proxy device. It effectively lets you say that you want TCP port whatever on one of the host IP to be forwarded to whatever in the container. Um, and it supports different modes. Like it will do, yeah, it will do IP tables or it will do um, some fancier internal proxying we do. So you can even forward between UDP and TCP and between Unix socket and TCP or we support a lot of weird combinations. 
All right, I'm going to go pretty quick because we've, as I said, we've done 10 releases, um, so I've got about a minute per release. The next one was a lot less busy, as it turns out when you only spend a month on one instead of three months, there's less stuff. Um, so we added backup support that lets you, through the API or CLI, export a container as a tarball, either just like a simple tarball of the root file system or an optimized version, which includes like a binary blob of the storage driver you're using. So if you're using BurFS or ZFS, you can get that optimized blob, which makes it much faster to re-import, and also will save you space um, because it bundles like all the snapshots and all the metadata alongside it. Um, we've added um, automatic fan networking for clusters, so that's effectively an overlay network that exists on Ubuntu. Um, if you enable clustering and you don't have a physical network that's shared between your containers, it will use that so that you get the same network and you don't have any weird issue with like a container being on one machine and another one being on another. Um, now going to 3.2, um, container migration between storage pools. So we did custom volumes, two releases before that, uh, but we still have a bit of a big gap where like containers could not be moved between two storage pools on your system. So finally fixed that. We've expanded what the proxy device can do by adding support at that point for Unix uh, circuits, both abstract and normal file based, um, UDP and port ranges. And we've also made it possible with like a single REST API call to join a node into a cluster, whereas before it was like five or six calls. Um, then, next release, we've added um, a feature that lets a container pull images from its host. So if, you want, if you're on LexD inside LexD, it can avoid going on to the network to download the image. It can just download it straight from the host. So it's a pretty convenient pass-through. We've added um, so a new API to query networking details from the host. So that includes getting um, packet count, byte count, all that kind of stuff for any network device. It's pretty useful for clusters when you want to like, look at a remote host and whether it's actually going to be compatible with what you want. Uh, we've added a sm small feature that people kept requesting, which is like a flag you can set on a container so that you can't delete it without first setting that flag, because people do typos and frankly not like it so much when their production containers go away. Um, so we did that. And on the proxy side, we added support for the HA proxy uh, header protocol, and we added um, UID, GID mode control for Unix sockets. Uh, as well as supporting um, privilege dropping in the proxy device, which was needed uh, if you are using a proxy device to forward X11 traffic. Because we can use that device not only for like normal web traffic or whatever, but you can also use it to, to forward your X7 socket to the container so you can run graphical applications. Um, and for that, you need the uh, UID and GID to line up with your own user, so we need the privilege dropping for that. And we've added a built-in uh, pprof server that you can turn on on any address you want to then pull statistics or debug data out of Lexi when it's running. All right, um, after that, so we improved on, to, on top of what we did for the automatic uh, overlay net feature for um, the bridge on clusters by also having a DNS forwarding protocol effectively that makes it so that the local, so we use DNS mask in the back end and DNS mask will generate records for your containers. But if you're in a cluster, you want to see all of them, not just the ones that are on your machine. So we've added uh, logic to effectively forward and replicate those across the cluster so that d the DNS view is also consistent. Um, we've added a new API that would let us pull all the data you need to list all your containers and all details in a single REST query instead of like three per container or something we had before. That made things massively faster, obviously. That's why we were working on getting um, effectively listing and tracking with 10,000 containers to take about 30 seconds instead of uh, five or six minutes. So we, we got that to be pretty reasonable. And we've added file capabilities support in a bunch of different places that included uh, when remapping the container, uh, when unpacking images, like as some mentioned earlier in this room, uh, file capabilities are getting pretty important for things like ping. Um, and we were running into problems there, so we made sure that we used the feature that landed a few kernels ago uh, to support unprivileged file capabilities, and that LexD itself knows how to read them, convert them, and write them properly um, as it remaps the containers. All right, at a release, um, that one we improved our external authentication support. So we support something uh, called macaroons, which are fancy cookies, hence the name. 
um, that lets you do decentralized authentication and external authentication for LexD. So we've added support for multiple domains um, in there. We've added uh, extra checks uh, for security, and we've added um, separately. We did some work uh, to guarantee that the cluster upgrade is consistent. So effectively, having the nodes that are not upgraded yet be aware that they need to upgrade now, so they can do something about it instead of waiting until someone updates. Um, then, and I need to really start speaking fast now. Um, next release was so pretty big one. We added projects, so that's a way of grouping containers, images, and profiles um, and hiding them from each another. That's very convenient when you're working on a bunch of different things on a system, or if you've got a system shared with multiple people, you can use that feature to isolate who can see what, effectively, and grouping things together. We've added, um, done some more, some more work on storage with snapshots. We've done the initial secret v2 support. Um, just initial, we don't do any of the fancy controllers yet. Um, added support for encrypted certificates, because, yes, if someone stole your LexD credit, it'd be, it'd be bad, so now we support password protection there. Um, as Christian mentioned this morning, we added U-Event injection for USB devices, um, and we improved some of our network handling to make it faster. Um, password another release, we added uh, incremental container copies, so that lets you update a existing container um, to effectively run a backup host, and you can run background copies from one host to another and just keep that container up to date. We've also switched our default keys to elliptic curve, um, mostly because some architectures were stupidly slow with RSA. Um, so EC was significantly faster to generate for what should be actually slightly better security. Um, and I think that's the last one. I hope so. Uh, it is. Um, we've added automated uh, container snapshots recently, so you can give a cron type pattern on your container, and LexD will generate snapshots for you. Uh, we've added support for moving containers uh, between projects. We've added support for replicating images within a cluster to make sure that you can't end up in a situation where You've got an image in the database, but it's nowhere near on disk because the node that had it is gone. Uh, and we've added support for uh, better configuring what address you want clusters to use for the internal traffic and for public traffic. And that's it. That was a pretty busy year. I mean, we're, we're a team of three people. Uh, I mean, four now, but it's been a busy year. Um, and we expect next year to be just as busy, really. Um, so that's... How much time do I still have? Two minutes for questions. All right. Anyone's got anything? Uh, you mentioned config uh, backup of the containers. Uh, do you have the container configuration in this backup or only the storage? Oh, so um, backup right now, uh, the way we do it is so when you request a backup, it will create uh, that optimized starball effectively. It dumps it into one specific directory on the host that you could store onto whatever you want. There's no, just like, we, just like images on disk, you can't tie them to, an ex to a particular storage pool. Backups are the same way. Um, but you can totally uh, mount whatever you want on the backup directory and then it will store that there. Um, we might at some point make a way of actually tying that to a storage pool. It just gets tricky, and if you try to delete the storage pool, um, there are a bunch of corner cases that are a bit funny. Thanks for some good work this year. Uh, just a question, what's the status of Wayland and LXD containers? Mm -hmm. Um, so we've not, I've never actually, even though my laptop runs Wayland, I usually just forward X11 and let's, let X Wayland do its thing. Uh, but uh, the Chromebooks are Wayland. And clearly they've got it working. I'm not sure exactly what socket they need to pass. I think it actually depends on the compositor and the way that the, the API works for a particular shell effectively. Um, but it's clearly possible because that's what the Chromebooks are doing. Hi. Uh, again, thank you for a nice presentation and all, all your work. Uh, there's been some changes uh, in, with introducing the proxy service, and I'm wondering how does it behave with uh, containers that, I mean, if it's just IP tables, nothing, how does it behave with uh, containers migrating across the cluster, and does it actually do proper nothing to wherever the container is within the cluster? No, so that, yeah, that part it doesn't, um, and that's obviously a bit of a problem sometimes. Um, more... 
reasonably often, people that run clusters will also have like an externally managed network, and they just manage it as part of the network rather than expecting Lexi to be the gateway. Uh, we could do some very fancy things if we wanted, uh, because that proxy, as I mentioned, like, doesn't only do IP tables, it also does its own thing, where effectively it can attach to two namespaces and then does internal proxying between the two, which is very convenient because it means you can, you can have a container that actually has no networking, and you bind the service on localhost in that container, and you can totally have the proxy proxy to that. That works fine. In theory, we could change that thing to also proxy internally through API over the network, but it's, it seems like a lot of work, and we've not really had a strong enough use case to, to spend a month trying to do that. That's it. All right, thank you.